I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, this is a new technology for us here at Shelter and I'd just like to go through some of the Zoom etiquette. If you could please uh, mute your microphones, that would be greatly appreciated. And also, in terms of the Q&A we're having at the end, if you could virtually raise your hands, that would be absolutely brilliant. Um, I would just really, really love to thank Dr. Andrew Davies and Professor, Professor Lisa Wood for uh, joining with us today. Uh, they are two world-renowned experts and they are giving their time generously. So thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Andrew. Uh, many of you would know Associate Professor Lisa Woods. Lisa is a Senior Research Fellow at the Centre of Social Impact at the University of Western Australia. Her research and teachings are complemented by nearly three decades of experience in public health and health promotion, both nationally and internationally. And Lisa is well known and a great friend of the homelessness services sector here in WA. Uh, Dr. Andrew Davies is the founder of Homeless Healthcare, which was set up in 2008 to advance and promote the health of people who experience homelessness and marginalised people in WA and in Perth particularly. He has enormous experience in working with people experiencing homelessness as a GP. Andrew's got a great vision to improve the health of people who experience homelessness and marginalised people and also to provide health education to other professionals. So thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Andrew. Um, this is an extraordinary time nationally and internationally. And to be able to share your vast knowledge and expertise is uh, certainly appreciated. So in terms of the order of proceedings today, um, both Professor Wood and Dr Davies will be giving a presentation and there will be Q&As at the end and that's where we're gonna trial this beautiful virtual hand raising. So uh, please bear with us if there are any technical glitches. And um, I will now hand over to our IT extraordinaire people, Heather Bush and Royston Hardy to make this session work well. Thank you. Fingers crossed this works. Excellent. Good morning, everybody. It's great to have so many people interested um, in COVID-19, but I guess that's because it's such a topical uh, topic at the moment. Um, I would like to start with a bit of a disclaimer. We're all kind of learning here. Um, so Lisa and I don't feel like we're experts. Um, some of the information that we will be sharing with you today will change with time. Um, and so we'll probably be doing updated webinars in the future. Um, I too, on behalf of UWA and Homeless Healthcare, would like to acknowledge that we are situated on Noongar land. So what exactly is COVID-19? It's a, a virus from the group of viruses that are known as coronaviruses, and they're so called because of the um, spikes that they have on their outside that make them look like they have a crown and in Latin corona um, means crown. They're a bit large family of viruses, there are lots of different types, they generally cause respiratory and or gastrointestinal symptoms. The respiratory symptoms are usually a simple common cold but can go through to quite advanced cases of uh, pneumonia. Um, and we've had a couple of them over the last sort of 20 years that have caused very severe disease such as SARS, MERS um, and of course now we have um, the new novel coronavirus. I think we'll um, start with how it's transmitted and it's mainly from person to person transmitted mission. Uh, those droplets when a person um, infected sneezes or coughs, um, surfaces may become contaminated and we pick up the droplets uh, from those surfaces with our hands, uh, certainly sharing food, drinks, cigarettes or any other objects, particularly asthma inhalers, um, with someone who has been infected may result in you having an infection. 
I think the main thing that I would like to emphasize about this is that most people get a mild infection. Um, they usually, the symptoms start within two to 14 days after they've been exposed. Some people don't get any symptoms at all. And then most people will get a bit of a fever and a dry cough. It may be as bad as the sort of seasonal flus that we get, but usually it's not even that bad. Um, in some cases, there's shortness of breath. You can get muscle pains, tiredness, and a sore throat. And as mentioned before, some people will go on and have more advanced disease, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Just to give you an idea, there are symptoms that are more commonly associated with COVID-19. There's symptoms that are more commonly associated with the common cold, and there's symptoms that are more commonly associated with the flu. But it's absolutely impossible for us on a clinical basis without a test result to be able to distinguish confidently between these different illnesses. So 80% of people who get symptoms have mild symptoms and only about 14% will get severe disease requiring hospitalization and 6% will become critical Ill, critically ill. It is very difficult at this stage of the um, epidemic to be able to confidently say what the case fatality is, but the latest figures are thought to be between 0.3 and 1% of people will die from the illness. Just for the more medical people there, this is some of the complications that people um, who were hospitalized in Wuhan, China, um, suffered from when they had COVID-19. Just to give you a bit better of an idea about the sort of mortality um, and, and that, when we look at the 1918 Spanish flu, the number of people that were dying was more than 2% of the population that got the virus. Um, compared that with sort of the usual flu that goes through each season, which is about one in a thousand people or 0.1%. Um, swine flu had a very low mortality, but a lot of people did die from it because a lot of people got infected. And then MERS and SARS have quite high fatality rates in comparison to these viruses that we've been talking about. It is very important for all of us to realize that for most of us, this disease is not going to be a problem. We will get nothing more than a common cold. There are, however, certain groups that are much more susceptible to infection and much more susceptible to dying from the infection. The biggest group is the elderly people in our population. So at the moment, the reason why both Lisa and I are in isolation is not to protect us from the infection. It is in case we have the infection to protect older and vulnerable people from getting the infection. If too many um, of the elderly or vulnerable people get an infection at the same time, it will override our hospital system and we will not have enough ICU beds or hospital beds to look after people and therefore more people will die from the infection. These are the fatality rates that were taken from Wuhan in China, which was a situation where they did have overwhelmed hospitals um, and so the fatality rate was higher than what it has been in other parts of the world. Italy is another place where they're struggling with very high fatality rates. So apart from older people, um, which in the general population is those aged sort of 70 plus, and in the homeless population is those aged 50 plus, other people that are at risk are those that have existing health conditions. Don't get alarmed by the numbers there. They're just um, the number of people that were already hospitalized that had that condition that passed away. So there are certain conditions that make it much more likely that you're going to pass away from this disease. Um, so hypertension, any heart disease in particular, respiratory conditions, diabetes, and things that suppress the immunity. 
People who smoke tobacco are certainly more likely to get respiratory infections and they may also be more likely to pass away. I think most alarmingly in all of this is that our homeless population has a very high incidence of comorbidities. We actually looked at this um, with some of the data that we've been anal an analyzing with UWA. Um, and what it's, what it's shown is that 13% of our patients have chronic respiratory conditions, 8% have diabetes, 79% smoke, a lot have low immunity due to poor diet, food insecurity, and drug use. And when we looked at it, there was 20.5% of the patients that had attended hospital or been admitted, so attended ED or had been admitted with one of these risk factors in the last couple of years. In addition to the comorbidities that cause problems with uh, uh, the actual viral infection, there's also comorbidities that are very common amongst homeless people that make it more difficult to cope with the overall situation that's occurring at the moment. So whether or not we'll get infection, the anxiety associated with that. I think I should probably pause on this slide for the rest of the talk almost, but um, what they've shown in routine seasonal coronavirus is that washing your hands after coughing and sneezing is the single biggest thing that reduces the infection spreading to other people. So whatever you are doing, then you need to be washing your hands regularly. If you spend more than five minutes in a room with a person who has coronavirus, then that doubles your likelihood of getting the infection. And they've shown that in the week prior to getting the respiratory infections, these activities are more common. Um, I did notice last night that um, we're no longer allowed to go to church. Um, and this is the reason why, because it's a place where we can spread the infection from person to person. I just have two slides that talk a little bit about whether or not people are suitable to be in a residential accommodation facility. Um, and first and foremost is whether the person's actually well enough. If they're too sick, they need to be in hospital. Um, people need to be able to understand what's going on and what they need to do. It would be ideal if they have a working phone, need to be close to hospital, um, that they're not going to be spreading infection to other people that they live with. Um, is it possible for them to go anywhere else? Um, can their housemates go anywhere else? Um, do we need to be putting people who have this infection together, otherwise known as cohorting? Um, and are any of the housemates particularly vulnerable? And that's particularly relevant for our population that's been rehoused if they've got people staying with them when they've got this illness. And can we give advice, obviously, to reduce transmission? So ideally in a residential facility, you want people to be in single occupancy rooms where they have access to an ensuite. They have to have sufficient cutlery and crock crock crockery that they do not need to share, that it can be washed after they use it. Um, it would be ideal if we had face masks, there's a bit of shortage of them at the moment, but certainly need to have sufficient paper towels, waste disposal bags and cleaning products. And are we able to temporarily and securely store the waste or laundry before it is either cleaned or thrown away? And the person needs to be able to get support getting groceries, prescriptions and other personal needs. For all of those that are working in the health and associated industries with people who uh, may have this infection, this is a great educational um, online tool that the government has that you can go to um, and just learn a little bit more about preventing the spread of the infection. There are still a lot of unknowns 
And I think there are a lot of people working on trying to work out some of these unknowns. Um, there are, you know, we, we actually don't even know how long people are contagious for. It, probably around 10 days after testing positive, but we do know that the virus can survive in some people up to six weeks after they test positive. Um, and we don't know how long the virus can survive on different surfaces. We think it's in the region of about six hours, but it may be longer. Um, different impacts by age group. There is evidence that's changing. Um, although young people are less likely to have complications from the viral infection, um, there is some evidence that they're not invincible. Um, we are uncertain when they're going to have a vaccine. Generally speaking, they're at the sort of stage where it's probably still one or two years away. Um, and we also don't know about cases of COVID-19 that's happening. Uh, what, well, well, there's a little bit that we do know about what's happening elsewhere in the world, but there's a lot about what we don't know about what's happening with this illness amongst homeless populations across the world. Lisa, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so in the next little bit, uh, I guess one of the things we've been really conscious of is uh, what information is available both for people who are homeless but also for those working for them. And we had an interesting situation of being uh, both in London for the Homeless Health Conference recently. And I, as it escalated and um, Andrew got back just before the quarantining and then I was virtually extra, got extradited, I was searching myself for information about what it means, what, what does self-isolation mean? And what was clear is that the information I was reading, what I would be able to do is quite different than what would apply uh, for someone who is uh, homeless. Slide man. Uh, so for those of you working at the coalface with people homeless who have been in this space for a long time, uh, these won't surprise you. But uh, I think um, what has been challenging is to just remind uh, the wider public and the wider uh, funders responding to the COVID crisis, that these are some of the basics that um, are just impossible. And certainly uh, Andrew and I wrote a letter to the MJA about, about, you know, how can you social distance if you don't have a home? How can you, uh, when not, all of us are struggling to get soap and uh, hand sanitizer, let alone if you're homeless. So um, these kind of things are, we know them if we're working with people who are homeless, but they're not well understood or appreciated by uh, the wider people. And that means that uh, there's really no point giving someone who is rough sleeping the standard government issue handout, like the one I got at the airport, uh, because they're just not going to be able to do those things. And and then if you are given advice and you can't do it, then that just escalates your anxiety. Uh, so um, this is uh, just the time urgency. So. Uh, I'm used to working at quite a, a, quite a pace, uh, but my definition of urgency and how quickly people can collaborate and do things uh, over the last week even uh, has changed. And I think um, a really amazing shout out to um, people that we've worked with in homelessness in other countries, um, literally been sharing uh, resources and ideas and frustrations um, 24 hours around the clock. Um, so this is an example of, I think because we saw a need, Andrew and I saw a need, and we talked to Leah Watkins, um, you know, also saying, um, what, can, what can we do? What can we provide people? And so Groundswell in the UK, which is well known for its work with people with lived experience and involving them in everything from research to program design and peer workers, uh, put together a resource, a fact sheet for uh, people who are sleeping rough or homeless. And so uh, they were happy for it to be adapted. Uh, so Andrew and I did some very speed adapting and um, uh, also uh, consulted with Leah. And I think this is, the, the time is just so precious. And so uh, for the next iteration of this, we certainly want to get some additional feedback from lived experience people here. Uh, we know it had it um, in the UK, but there was just an urgent need to get something out. So really it, um, it was released, I think in London last Wednesday. I saw it on Twitter Thursday, sent it to Andrew and Leah Friday. We worked on it. We had something out by, by Monday. Um, the Homeless Healthcare could provide. Uh, Tranby and Rua have them, and we've shared it with a few other people. 
Uh, and we'll be updating that as the advice changes and uh, Shelter's gonna make it available at the um, end of this. I guess I've just put on the, the right-hand side of that slide the things that I'm already hearing that seem to be um, other um, areas of advice or information that is needed. And so one, which we'll talk a bit about later, is around um, anxiety and worry, both for amongst clients and amongst staff working with them. So again, we've got some great things being rolled out by the Australian Psychological Society and others about um, how to manage your anxiety, but, but those things are not pitched at the kind of people that we're talking about. So uh, to say, don't keep watching endless news reels and do some yoga and spend time in your garden, it, those things just don't work. And I think the more we distribute that general information, it alienates the people that we're trying to care for because it just reflects that we don't get their world. Uh, I think huge um, pressures on staff and services uh, and all of us. And so um, I'll talk a bit about that later, but that seems to be a need. I think risk management for services this is a whole new world of all different scenarios that could come up um, with someone in your facility or someone you've been in contact with and what do we do? And, and I put an SOS out last night to our one of our heroes in homeless health, Jim O'Connell in the US said, have you, do, have, you had, have you got a protocol for this situation? He said, no, we're all just chasing, you know, responding to things. So the more we can kind of share how we respond to things, um, the better. And I guess um, we'll talk at the end about um, whether there's a role for um, Andrew and myself and others to play in kind of seeing what some of these frequently asked questions are. Um, and I think the other thing is about sifting the facts from the fiction. So we're all in information overload about COVID. Um, there are some kind of various understandings about, um, you know, how it's spread and how contagious people are. And that's why uh, we spent quite a bit of the time in this first webinar laying out the, um, the, the kind of clinical facts and transmission as Andrew presented, because um, sadly there is some kind of, uh, I guess, escalating of um, alarmism out there. Uh, so um, just to note, so Monday we've got our, um, our kind of home, home brand uh, fact sheet and uh, already uh, I had a contact from um, someone in um, Sydney saying, can you share it? We've got people that are just totally disconnected from any services. They've got no idea what's going on. We're hearing a lot and I'm sure people listening in today are as well about people being really, really terrified because they, they just don't know what to make of it and they're not getting the kind of regular Norman Swan Twitter updates that, that I'm getting every every 15 minutes. Um, and so I think the more that we can do this kind of information sharing uh, and, and look at ways to do that quickly and rapidly, uh, it, it gives us mechanisms to um, alleviate some of the fears whilst also um, none of us wasting time just reinventing the wheel. Um, so now for just the, the last part, and then we're gonna go into uh, questions. Uh, we really wanted to look at um, beyond having a, um, you know, an understanding of the disease and a, and a, and a fact sheet, what, what do we really need to be doing to reduce risk and save lives? And, and I guess just to stress up front and foremost that um, we're talking about homelessness today, but we're talking about it in the context of a, of a health pandemic and uh, the enormous urgency around um, reducing risk and transmission and preventing mortalities, as Andrew showed, um, those, I mean, I work with stats and his homeless stats a lot. And I have to say, when, when we did the analysis last week of um, people with uh, risk factors that are presented to hospital, uh, I was really shocked to see that it was 20%. I mean, we're, this is a really vulnerable group. So we're just gonna go through kind of four things that we think we need to do. So the first one is, uh, I think what Australia needs and uh, our state and all of us are concerned about this is we really a really clear health strategy to reduce the spread of COVID and fatalities amongst people homeless. And one of the challenges I'm seeing in Australia is that we have the way portfolios are in government and um, in the community and the way things are funded is we've got homelessness sector looking at their response, we've got health looking at their response, we've got um, people in the treasury looking at their response. And, and the reality is that homelessness crosses all those, all those sectors and um, it, the, the, the health piece has to be um, foremost in all those. And so, uh, we had some great news uh, just yesterday. Queensland has put out a package of support around uh, accommodation and housing and tenancy support. Fantastic. Um, and there is mention of some accommodation options for people to self-isolate. But where are those people going to get their, um, their clinical uh, care for? And I'll talk a bit, about that, a bit more about that in the next slide. So um, we have been working closely with our 
um, some two amazing uh, people in the UK are um, Andrew Hayward, who, for those of you who are a social determinants fan, is Michael Marmot's boss. Uh, well, I always chuckle at the notion of Michael Marmot having a boss, and our story. So they've, they've led a lot of work in the UK around homelessness, and they have, at great speed, put together a really comprehensive plan, 35 pages, uh, that went to government around what the response needs to be. And so these are the kind of five key elements they outline. So um, protecting the most vulnerable. So this is where the information Andrew talked about is really critical, that yes, we want to get people off the street as quickly as possible, but um, in medical language, we, we have to do some triage and we have to identify those who are most risk of getting ill and those at most risk of, of dying. So that, that's fundamental. Uh, we want to reduce transmission risk. So that's why, um, you know, I know Tramby has already got in place, you know, how many people can be in there, um, all the protocols that many services that maybe are listening in are already following, which is about reducing uh, the, the spread of it um, in, in any kind of places. Uh, one of the things they, they flag, particularly in the UK model, so I've left it in for hours, um, although it might be a little bit alarmist, is um, this is literally their wording about preventing the explosive transmission um, and spread within um, places where there's uh, residential accommodation or settings where people congregate. And so this, this is something that is not on the mainstream kind of strategy because we're all being told to stay at home. But for the population group we're talking about today and other vulnerable groups, uh, that's not the case. So this this thing about reducing the um, the contagion in uh, places where people are living together um, is really critical. And and we all saw what happened in that um, Florida nursing home, and we don't want that to be here. Uh, the fourth point is also really critical: is about um, minimising the impact on the public health system and essential services. So as Andrew said, a lot of the measures being put in place are not just about protecting our own health or those of the people we love or work with. It's about all of us preventing uh, a total overload of, of the health system. And I've been um, following on Twitter some of the workers in the NHS um, and, the, and the US, and it, it, it's deeply disturbing about, you know, they're already working, you know, 68 hour shifts. Um, they're, they're running out of beds. Doctors are describing themselves as literally running from patient to patient. So I don't want to scare you, but, but it just shows that uh, there's going to be so much pressure on the health system, and, and this is only in the early days of it. So the more we can do to uh, reduce it getting hold in the homeless community and then also um, providing uh, community-based um, primary care um, so that they're, they're not going into hospital. And we know that people who are homeless around Australia uh, tend to use the ED much more than um, the general population and use it in the way that we might uh, go to, to our GP. And we've been working in uh, WA to reduce that through homeless healthcare and others and having a homeless team at Royal Perth. But now it's going to be even more critical about how for these um, rough sleepers we're talking about trying to get off the street uh, quickly as possible in WA, uh, how are they going to access uh, um, primary healthcare support? And then the final element in the UK plan is about preventing high mortality, which comes back to um, how we're ensuring uh, equitable access of, of care and treatment for those, uh, those most vulnerable. Uh, so the second kind of key point uh, that segues from that is uh, the need to achieve a lot of those things I've just talked about is that we need to um, accommodate people as quickly as possible. Um, and um, we also need to um, have access to COVID testing and that, that's been a big issue in Australia and different countries have responded with different speed or not speed uh, around the availability of that. Uh, our colleagues in Boston, the UK are trialing some mobile um, methods of, of testing. So I'm, I don't even know where we're gonna go with that, but we know that this is a population group that, that, uh, that they often have really negative experiences of health services. So they're not necessarily gonna be wanting to turn up at a, uh, a, a COVID clinic um, where there's you know 80 people waiting around. Um, so uh, we need places urgently where people can quarantine or self-isolate. And we're already hearing um, you know, examples in, in the homeless sector in Perth of where people have potentially symptomatic and it's like, well, what do you do with those? And I know uh, some of the residential places have been really proactive and setting up uh, isolation rooms, but you know, if it takes hold, then, then just a few isolation rooms is not gonna be enough. So we need places where people can um, quarantine or self-isolate. Uh, I know one of the states over east is looking at um, commandeering an old nursing home for that purpose. Um, 
UK and France have, have um, are using hotels for that purpose. Uh, I think we, we need to not forget that even though COVID is um, front and centre of all our minds, uh, this is a population group with a lot of ongoing health conditions and they're gonna need uh, access to primary care. So at the moment, a lot of them, homeless healthcare runs um, lots of clinics during the week that people can go to at the drop-in centre, they can go to the GP clinic, there's street doctor going out, there's other services that people can access. So if they're, if we get them off the street into accommodation, that's fantastic, but where are they gonna get the, um, the ongoing primary care they need? Uh, the methadone treatment, access to depot if they have psychosis, management of their diabetes, management of the risk factors that actually put them at higher risk of dying. Uh, the fourth one there is the, just a critical need for mental health support um, and that, uh, that that's going to be an issue for I think anyone homeless and, and probably for all of us uh, with the um, anxiety that's unfolding but uh, I guess particularly uh, for those who are going to be uh, taken off the street and in some countries they're now talking about people who are vulnerable being literally being locked down for 12 weeks so that's a really long time uh, and that would mess with my head, to be honest. So uh, really, how are we going to ensure that people have access to mental health um, support and, uh, you know, GPs to be part of that and, um, you know, even ramping up the uh, pilot um, outreach dual diagnosis service that we have with Homeless Healthcare where the money's run out, but we're, we're trying to keep it going. Uh, and then I think my last point there is just um, how critical it is for the health sector to have input into identifying those at greatest risk and and triaging accommodation. So the UK model they're talking about is identifying who is, if you're symptomatic, you get sent to a certain type of accommodation and there's a level of um, care and support there. Uh, if you are waiting testing results, you're in a different type of place, um, maybe more healthcare on site. If you have it or are having to quarantine, then it, and, and also obviously we've got to factor into it people's other vulnerabilities. So I think, um, the homelessness sector has really rallied amazingly in WA around this, but um, some of these decisions around who we house most quickly and where and what support they need, um, the, the health is a critical piece in that. Doing my nod, Andrew. Um, so just, um, I think just, yeah, building on the accommodation and Andrew already touched upon what, what it means when we talk about suitable accommodation, that what's suitable in kind of, um, Perth two months ago when we weren't thinking about COVID and we thought well, that would do now. Um, so particularly things like bathroom, um, not sharing supplies is really critical. Uh, I think we need to be thinking about, well, if they're in kind of shared accommodation, how to respond to that. And my last point there is just what, uh, sadly, I think many of us are predicting is, um, this is already a group that has high level of uh, social isolation, loneliness, um, much fewer social support networks than, than many of us listening today would have. And uh, because of the, the shutting down of services and the reduced capacity of services that we're already seeing, uh, at, a, at the time when people most need uh, support and, and social contact, uh, it's, it's not available either because everyone's been told to stay home or just because those services can't, um, can't meet demand. And so we have no easy answers for that, but I think we can't let that slip off, off the radar. Uh, what else do we need? So I've just included, um, I won't um, talk about this in detail, but I wanted to put them into the talk because I guess this has been something I've been thinking a bit, quite a lot about over the last couple of days and conferring with some colleagues um, overseas. I SOS them and said, oh, do you have any kind of resource about people who are homeless feeling anxious or staff feeling anxious? They said, no, but that'd be a great idea. Send us one if you do it. So uh, I think we're all seeing similar issues around the country. So um, I picked the brains of uh, a social work colleague of mine at UWA, Stephen Lund. So shout out to him uh, around some of the things that um, might be applicable strategies for people themselves uh, and then also for staff and also Dr. James Hickey, who's the, um, the uh, addiction and mental health specialist with Homeless Healthcare. So uh, I won't through, read through those, but I've just got them... Um, on the, on the slide there, but I think one the one that I, I do want to draw attention to is, I think for all of us, um, it is about uh, reminding people that it's that it's okay and and normal to feel anxious at a time like this, and that's what uh, James Hickey was reminding me of last night for myself and um, in prepping this talk that um, if people are feeling anxious, you know, we don't need to medicalise it, but that's just that's just reality of how people feel in a pandemic, particularly one that's that's happening so quickly. 
And uh, I think the other key thing just to stress for this population that's unique is that some of the language that's being used in terms of the COVID response can be really triggering. We know from the homeless healthcare data that nearly 20% uh, have diagnosed PTSD, um, uh, probably higher uh, than that. And so, and, and we know that um, many, many, many have had um, through the VIS for that have reported experience of being taken into a mental health institution against their will. I think in the VIS for that, you know, over 60% or something have been uh, in the police uh, lockup more than at one point. Uh, lots have been in prison. So, so the language about lockdown, uh, which makes me shudder when I when I when I hear it, I just think must be really disturbing for people who've had these traumatic experiences and uh, for people who've been in kind of abusive relationships or in institutional care. So I think um, both mindful of ourselves, but also if staff are working at the coalface, that, that these kind of things might uh, be playing out in people's anxiety and uh, are relevant to um, our own language as well. And so that that second slide that's up there now is, is more around um, um, the staff and, and, and services and how we uh, manage things ourselves. And uh, I guess James's point in that circle on the left was that the people who are at the front line, um, it is about um, you know, trying to model the things that we want to um, resonate with, with the, um, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the clients that we're seeing. And, and I was ranting to him about, you know, a lot of these tips about, you know, how to distract yourself with hobbies and gardening and get a new cookbook, and, you know, aren't applicable. But he said, you know, just come back to the fact that it is about um, distracting and taking your mind off things. And um, that will be different. That's going to be really different for people who are in a homeless situation or, if you're a uh, frontline worker, exhausted, but but the, the thing is about taking our mind away from the worry at, at some point. Uh, and so we just wanted to stress, because I'm um, very conscious of not um, being anxiety triggering ourselves in this presentation, uh, that uh, most people um, who get COVID um, do recover. And, and so more and more of the stats that are coming out, and we'll just put the web link there for the John Hopkins, which is monitoring uh, trends um, nationally so it's easy to lose sight of and think that we're all at really high risk and uh, but actually um, you know lots of people as Andrew said if they get it it's it's super mild or they may even have it and they're not aware of it um, a small proportion will get sick and need hospitalizing and uh, or medical care and that will be higher in our homeless population uh, but even of those who get it uh, most people who get it um, are recovering and and we're seeing that data now coming out of um, even Italy, where it seems so bleak about the fatalities that actually, um, you know, many more hundreds of thousands are, are recovering. Uh, so the fourth thing that we need is um, evidence-led advocacy for fast action. And so I think um, just the volume of people that have signed up for this, uh, you know, within two days, and a lot of the discussions we've been having is that really, uh, I don't think we could say that Australia's been on the front foot about responding to uh, this is for our most vulnerable populations. Uh, that we were hearing the same thing in the UK when we were there, but we were hearing it uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it was in the media a lot, a lot of people speaking out. There was an open letter to the Prime Minister from about 12 of the major uh, charities and peak bodies demanding a response to um, what was gonna be done about homelessness and COVID. The government then put out a strategy, they then put out some money, they're now putting in some more money for this rollout of the health strategy. So um, I know what a lot of us are really busy just delivering our, you know, our works have been kind of um, pivoted around to be addressing things that people have been pulled off what they're doing. But um, this, this advocacy piece is really important because um, I, uh, unfortunately my fear in Australia is that um, because of our kind of the silos of the way that um, government strategy and funding occurs is that uh, this has fallen through uh, the cracks a bit, and um, and it's certainly not um, front and centre of, what, of what's what's coming out at um, either state or national level. So I've just put some examples there um, just to show you that um, I mean it, it's a common thing, but uh, I suppose me from my public health perspective is already is trying to look at well where can we see other countries or places taking the lead and how can we uh, leverage off that to argue for the same here. And uh, with colleagues um, in other states uh, that we've worked with, we're also um, sharing that. So 
uh, where states have a bit of a breakthrough in getting the ear of government or getting some funding or getting some targeted health interventions, um, we'll be um, trying to leverage off that for uh, Western Australia. And I'd encourage you to all do your own bit. So just my last thing on that is, um, you know, lots of people might think, well, advocacy is a, is a thing that that's just certain people do it at a time like this. You never know. So I've got one of the people on my team, she knew an MP, he, she's had a conversation with him, he had a conversation with someone else. Um, you know, you might know someone in a, a business who knows someone or, you know, someone who knows someone who's a, friends with a journalist. I mean, I think we just, the more we actually have to have um, uh, some, all of us can speak up and say, but what about, what about the people who are homeless? What about those most vulnerable? What's, what's happening for them? Um, so uh, then just um, now handing over for questions, which are, uh, shelter is going to navigate for us. So just uh, just put up a caveat there that um, we're happy to answer questions, uh, but just to bear in mind that um, what is known is changing rapidly and some things are unknown. So if we say we don't know, uh, that's, that's because of our honest answer. But um, we just discussed with shelter this morning that potentially there's um, there might be a way that uh, if there are lots of questions, you might feel that you, they've all been answered, but if there are lots of questions or people feel that they want to be able to um, have, a, have a portal for asking them, that, that maybe we could um, be working here on some kind of uh, frequently asked questions and that that can be shared. And uh, Homelink in the UK, I didn't fit it on that slide because the font was getting too small, but that's another uh, UK website that has a number of resources for people working in homelessness. And I saw just last night that they have a frequently asked questions portal. It's, it's a bit tailored to the UK context, but it kind of gave the idea that we could do something here. Um, I've also put on there the link to uh, the UK um, a Faculty for Inclusion Health website because they're, they're posting some really good up-to-date stuff and that then links you to a whole lot of other things. And of course, Shelter um, WA has uh, has a portal as well. So I will hand over to questions and I did just want to um, just acknowledge at the end uh, that we, we were really grateful to Andrew Hayward in the UK for, for sharing some of his, uh, his slides that we've drawn on and really grateful to um, a couple of other colleagues that um, I've, I've roped in uh, to, to assist with um, putting this together and I'll hand over to Shelter. Oh, well, thanks, um, Lisa. And um, Andrew and Lisa, we're just really grateful to you. I mean, this has just been a phenomenal, generous um, providing information to our sector. And certainly we'll talk with you afterwards about um, some of the initiatives that we can progress to keep the conversation going. Now we have over 70 people um, on this Zoom conference. So managing this Q&A is going to be a fun task. So in terms of the process, what I'd like to do is I can see um, who's wanting to ask a question. If I mention your name, if you could unmute yourself, please just ask a short, sharp question, and then either Andrew or Lisa will respond. Um, and as Lisa said, this isn't the last opportunity for the conversation, and certainly you can email things through, and we'll work swiftly with uh, Lisa and Andrew to get information out to people. So in terms of questions, I think we have a question from it's going down this very fastly zooming screen. Okay. Right. Ask a question. Ask a question. We, um, we don't have anyone, as far as I can see, who wants to ask a question, which means that you've done a brilliant job. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, Andrew, mm -hmm. in terms of responding. Are Andrew, those... all asleep. That's now from um, United Way. We do have a question from Pat. Thank you. Um, I wasn't sure how to write that in. Um, I've got a couple of both. That was really useful. Um, and I did join late, so I apologise if you already covered this stuff. Um, I guess one of my questions is, do we know at this stage if people can um, get, get COVID-19 more than once? Um, the short answer is no, we don't know for sure. Okay. Um, the chances of of you being able to get it more than once is fairly unlikely, though. Okay, uh, thank you. And my other question is a bit more practical. Um, we are looking at doing some potential food delivery via a volunteer base, hopefully. Um, and I'm just wondering what the best 
source of information would be for us to go to to learn about the safest way for us to do that obviously it won't be people to people contact it will be delivery to the doorstep type thing um but even so um would you give some advice on where we should go to find the safest way to do that uh i'll answer well i won't answer that question but i'll um take it on notice that they say because i know i've been reading so much stuff so i can't actually remember where i read it but it, it was someone that had some um, kind of guidances around around that in terms of um you know dropping at the door and how they would notify people that, that it was there and and all of that so um can i i guess that's an example kath of of something that that is a really good question and and will be relevant to people whether it's food deliveries or other things um so i'll i'll go away and um shelter will there be a way for us to post some of these responses that we've had to look up afterwards um, absolutely so we're recording the video we're going to capture all the questions and then i think um andrew and lisa we need to have a conversation about an ongoing relationship formalize that with you because it's been just fabulous information um so kath thanks for the question if you could mute yourself um with respect uh, thank you um i'd like to invite richard usher to ask the question so richard unmute and go for it yeah, hi everybody, and and look, thanks for thanks for a great session. Um, I'm just wondering, um, are there any insights given you know um, potentially we've got one and a, one and a half million people nationally now being unemployed, and we don't know how long this is going to last for. Are there any insights as to what potential pressures are going to be put on the service, um, you know, the, the the support services for you know um, newly unemployed, which are going to come with their own kind of set of of issues and, and challenges. Uh, I'm happy to respond to that first, and then Andrew can add. Uh, Richard, I've just um, gone on to uh, a task force that our uh, Department of Communities has been convened around uh, homelessness, and uh, that certainly came up this morning about that when we talk about um, homelessness and people vulnerable and precarious housing, um, we're already struggling to get our heads around the demand for the current um, number of people in that situation, and with the um, it's not even projected unemployment. I mean, people are already being made redundant and, um, you know, fearful about um, losing their homes and things. So, I, yeah, I think that that's a, a massive issue about how we're going to, um, and again, how are the, the services in homelessness sector who work with um, tenancy for support or tenancy relief, uh, they're already stretched. They're more stretched by COVID with the existing population. And then we've got, got this massive potential flood of people uh, coming in who will be unemployed. So um, I'll be certainly banging on about that and I know that others are well. And I, and I guess um, my aside on that is that um, the more, I mean, it would be really fantastic if we had either government or some of the big uh, corporates that are <laughs> laying people off who are being really proactive around um, kind of pivoting what those people do and applying it to um, other kind of areas of work where we do have a greater need. And, and I love the example recently of uh, an airline in, in Sweden that of a thousand of their airline stewardesses, um, stewards that had been laid off, uh, they were giving them some quick uh, health training. They already had skills in uh, first aid. Um, they're good with um, dealing with uh, all kinds of people. So they're being used to kind of provide some support in the health sector, obviously not doing medical things, but um, you know, supporting it. Um, and my other favourite example of the week was the, uh, you know, the number of breweries that have um, repurposed their distilleries to make uh, sanitizer. So I think, um, you know, in addition to us worrying about people who are becoming unemployed, the more that we see there's this crying need for capacity in this kind of social sector, and the more that people who are losing their jobs or underemployed can be then um, encouraged to uh, to offer their services or provide their services to this sector would be really great. But I think it needs to be on a big scale, not just about, you know, people one on one volunteering. I think we want some leadership to say, you know, people that in sectors where a whole lot of people have been laid off, um, how can we then draw on their skills um, for some of this? And, you know, the travel industry is decimated. They've got amazing logistical skills. I mean, um, you know, so some of those people and the skills they could provide in coordinating some of the things we've been talking about even um, today would be fantastic. Uh, thanks, Lisa. So we do have a question from Tara Laflohik. So Tara, please unmute and uh, ask your question. Thank you. Um, good morning, all. 
Yeah, I'm as somebody with a lived experience of homelessness and living, you know, I lived in my car for 10 months and I relied on, um, you know, recreation centres to toilet and, and accommodate my hygiene needs. Those have all been closed. And I know that um, the public toilet, well, toilets in Target are always closed to the public and, and the public can use the toilet in Myers. And there's a, um, a shower and toilet facility around City Place somewhere, but you have to pay to use that, although it's a minimal um, amount. What, what do you, what do you, how, how is the City of Perth and other shires and cities accommodating um, the, the hygiene needs of homeless people at the time of this e epidemic, considering that one toilet paper is in, um, people are killing, killing each other over toilet paper. What, what's the strategy there? I'm very curious to find out. Thanks, Tara. So Lisa or Andrew, would you like to um, make a response? Or take it as a question on notion. Um, I, I can uh, say a few things. I think there's. A, I understand there's a um, meeting uh, involving some people with City of Perth uh, this afternoon. I think that's a really valid point, and um, particularly in a in a health pandemic where we're saying that hygiene is the critical, the number one kind of prevention, mm -hmm. and yet we've ripped out those opportunities. Not ripped mm -hmm. out, but you know they've um, they've been shredded in terms of where people can do that. Uh, I've had. Um, a conversation with um, another local government, I won't name them yet, but um, which is exactly around that some of those uh, closed uh, recreational venues, whether they could be uh, reopened for, for the purpose around vulnerable population groups. So um, I think it's really timely that you've suggested that. And, and I guess it also um, means that do we need to be looking at some of those, those temporary measures um, that, you know, the mobile laundries, the mobile toilets, mm -hmm. and which I think uh, Boston or one of the other countries has um, rolled out a whole lot of those um, port loos which probably were booked for festivals and weddings and all kinds of things in the next few months. So if they were booked, then, then they're there. Uh, you know, so some creative thinking uh, about about that. But, uh, um, and yeah, so uh, that's definitely something that um, I'd be happy to take forward and, and I guess particularly looking to shelter as well um, around okay. that. But I think that's great that you raised that. Um, Lisa, can I just add on also, is it possible that if you do something that you can actually provide a map or a, you know, a visual information document available on the website or through, through libraries or something? So homeless people, I mean, they're living up in the hills, they're camping in their cars, they're everywhere. That, uh, and there could be sort of a public announcement to show where they can access those um, centres for hygiene, whether it's a public toilet, a rec facility or, or something in their local, wherever they are, because, you know, they also have to travel there and it's not always possible to hold your, your bladder and your, and your bowel. It, it's going to be really difficult to, um, to make this quite pragmatic. Mm. Yeah, I think that, and that's something that I think would be, would be great to see uh, local government um, Mm. taking the leadership of that and having it something live. Um, I mean, that's outside of my, my skill set and my, my day job mm. where I'm meant to be doing research and teaching uni mm. students. But, um, mm. but I think it's really important and I think that's, that's, that's exactly the kind of thing we need in the sector. And we don't need working groups to think about how you would do it. We need just people with innovative ideas about how to just get on with it and, and you know, to be already um, posting what those options are or um, people kind of taking the initiative around whether it's opening up venues just for that, those purposes or, or those Waterloo's going to waste. So. Um, thank you. And thank you, Tara, for a really important question. Um, so we've got the opportunity for two more questions. Um, firstly, I'll go to Michael Chester and then I'll go to John Berger. Um, so Michael, could you unmute your um, laptop and uh, ask a question, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, we haven't spoken today at all about the specific needs that First Nations people might have in regard to um, the situation that we're facing and, and even at the level of understanding what it actually means. So are we aware of any specific strategies that are occurring around even something as simple and straightforward as translating some of this information into Noongar and other First Nations languages, but I guess more importantly, figuring out um, how to address the needs of First Nations people who might be off country as well. 
So, so I'm happy to respond to that. Um, from what we know, the Department of Communities is setting up a number of um, task forces coalescing around particular vulnerable groups. As Lisa mentioned, she's on the homelessness task force. We understand there will be a task force specifically looking at the needs of the Aboriginal communities and in particular remote communities. And Jack Riddle and Little John from the department is involved with that. So we met this morning with the Premier um, and a number of the ministers to put forward the need for swift and urgent action and the DG of Communities was there. Um, we hope to be able to get our information to the sector on the, the bureaucratic structure that we can interface with. But um, as Lisa said, the, the learnings from overseas is you can't just set up task forces. We need to take the great ideas, say what Tara mentioned, and just put them into action. So we will be providing further information later from what we learned from the meeting this morning. But I'm, um, I'm sorry, I'm conscious of time and we do have one question from uh, John Berger. John's the um, EO for the WA Alliance to End Homelessness. So John, if you could unmute your, uh, your laptop and ask a question uh, swiftly, that would be very appreciated. Hi, Michelle. Um, look, it's not so much a question but a response to Tara's question. Um, I'm meeting with the City of Perth this, af uh, this afternoon to address this very issue about um, what services are still going to continue to be able to be delivered and I'll include that question about access to public facilities. So just to assure um, Tara and others that um, we're onto that issue and um, there is uh, dialogue happening around that. So, yep. Thank you, John. And uh, certainly we're in conversations with the WA Local Government Association, so we'll progress that. I'm also working closely with John. We're trying to think of a really strategic and critical way we can bring in the voice of the experience to inform all of the responses, because without that, um, we, we don't have the information that we do need for, a, for an urgent response. So I'm conscious of time. Um, so unfortunately, if you do have a question, um, you won't be able to ask it at this session, but you can email it through. Um, in closing, I would just really, again, like to thank Professor Lisa Wood and Dr. Andrew Davis. Um, your knowledge and experience is immense and your ability to tap into your international networks at this time is critical. We're learning from what's happened overseas and hopefully getting ahead so we can flatten the curve um, so thank you everybody. Um, this has been recorded and we'll send out the link and it will be available on our website. Certainly uh, here at Shelter WA what we will do is uh, work closely with people to get the resources needed out to the sector but importantly work to get the funding, access to housing, workforce continuity, all of those things the sector need so they can deliver services to the people on the street in overcrowded housing, in congruent living, that need it most. So um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I trust this was of use. We'll talk about developing future webinars um, based on the questions that come through. Uh, so thank you, please stay healthy, please stay well, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks. <laughs>